My name is Trevor Vaughn, and I will be going over multi-node acceptance tests for fun and profit. Because they are fun, no, well, okay, it's, it's good stuff. All right, I am, also, I am uh, the VP of Engineering for Onyx Point Incorporated, and I'm also the SIMP product lead. SIMP is a, um, a large uh, compliance automation platform that is mostly open source. Um, and we use, we do multi-node acceptance testing extensively within the platform. Um, and I wanted to kind of share that since we've had a lot of questions about how we do it. <clears throat> so I'm one of the founders of Onyx Point. Um, I'm one of the creators of the SIMP project. And I have done many ridiculous things with Puppet, Inspec, and Beaker over time. Um, as you can see from my shirt that I got just for you guys, um, this talk is going to be primarily about Beaker. A little bit of background. Um, many years ago in 2007, um, we started using Puppet. It was Reductive Labs at the time, if anybody remembers the old days. Um, SIMP, SIMP started around 2009. Our spec Puppet was introduced in 2012, so we got some unit testing. Beaker was introduced as a keynote in uh, 2014. SIMP started developing multi-node testing capabilities in 2015. The PDK came out in 2018, and then here we are at the present day. So this is kind of a culmination of all of these things we've used over time, hopefully in a very reusable manner for all of you. And uh, so I want to start off with why acceptance testing is important. Um, obviously, you always do unit tests, right? Everybody does unit tests. Our spec puppet, it's good stuff. Um, that lets us at least know we have no basic problems with our code and with our puppet manifests. Um, and I split up acceptance testing into two levels. Level one is, can be done by Beaker, Litmus, Test Kitchen, tools like that. It's generally a single host and it answers the question of whether or not your code works on a single representative system. Level two is defined as um, whether or not something works in a complex network representative system. So more than one node having to communicate using real protocols <clears throat> with real complex configurations. To date, the only thing we found that actually settles this concretely is Beaker. We've tried all of them, we try extending them, and currently they just don't have the capabilities that Beaker does. So why do I like Beaker? It handles puppet or non-puppet environments. It is essentially, as one of my colleagues likes to say, a vagrant of vagrants. Um, Docker, VirtualBox, LibVirt, raw nodes, AWS, GCE, the gamut. Basically, it connects to everything. Um, and it even connects to bare metal uh, systems, which can be interesting if you want to connect to network devices or you know, representative systems that you can't otherwise reproduce, such as AIX systems, which are always fun to test. Um, and it exposes the host data for all of your hosts during the testing. So you can actually in, uh, basically introspect about the entire environment while you're running your tests. It has very straightforward components. It has node sets, which are host group configurations, uh, virtual machine specific configurations if you wanted to use a combination of Docker and VirtualBox or Docker and GCE, different types of um, uh, the, uh, virtual environments. Um, the tests are just RSpec. Being just RSpec means you can use tools like Pry. Pry is a Ruby tool for kind of digging into code and give you, giving you a, um, a REPL environment for kind of digging into your code live and debugging. Um, and it has a plugin system that is quite modular and you can add basically what you need and share them as Ruby gems. <laughs> so you can extend everything in the way we're used to in, in a Ruby testing environment. Um, the SIMP project developed something called SIMP Beaker Helpers as a gem. Uh, it is not SIMP specific. We just namespaced it so that it didn't conflict with the million other Beaker Helpers that may, may exist. Um, and I'll be going to that a bit later. So, what could use a bit of work with Beaker? Um, the documentation isn't great. Um, <clears throat> it's not consolidated, it's out of date in many cases. Um, it's one of those areas where, as in most open source projects, if you get in and you think you can fix the docs, it would be great to have, to have contributions there. Um, generally, we use the API documentation as our source of truth, and we really dig in there to figure out how things work. There's, quite a, there's also quite a, bit, quite a bit of code cruft over time. Beaker became a kind of a sprawling project, got split up into multiple gems, got consolidated well over time, but it's still got some kind of legacy of the old days. Um, code that was developed to install Puppet 3, for instance, and, and things like that, that uh, just hasn't been cleaned up. 
But it is important to note that it still is a solid functional code base. It works, and it has worked for many years. Um, and again, it's the only thing we found that works with multi-host setups. Again, mentioning the community, we always want people to contribute. Um, I, I contribute to Beaker. I am not a Beaker. Uh, I do not run the Beaker project. Puppet does. Um, but they are pretty good about pulling in contributions from uh, the community. So PDK came out fairly recently, kind of hit mainstream uh, recently in 2018. And so I'm going to actually go through setting up Beaker with PDK using the modern tool sets. Um, the Puppet Development Kit is stated as the shortest path to better modules, and I've defined Beaker as the shortest path to functional multi-node testing. Um, and it's written right now pretty much the only path unless you roll it from scratch. All right, so my first question of the day, who likes constant walls of code? And I really hope it's all of you. Um, I tried to make this slide deck in a way that you can copy and paste from later. The idea being that you can download it, you can literally just pull up and, and copy and paste the content and run this in your environment with PDK. So, first wall of code. Basics of setting up a PDK project. <coughs> Excuse me, that's gonna do that. Um, so what I've tried to do is, is basically highlight the commands you're gonna need to run in white, so it's easier to see. Uh, the materials in green are useful information. Um, but in this case, I use mostly Red Hat style systems, so we're installing PDK via YUM. Um, we're creating a new module called the multi-node module owned by the demo user. So PDK new module demo dash multi-node. Answer whatever questions PDK throws at you. Um, we hop into the multi-node module and then it has all these default files at the bottom that have been generated by PDK. So that's it. We've now, created a, we've now installed PDK, created a new module, and we're ready to actually start doing something with the module. So the first thing we need to do is install VirtualBox and Vagrant. Now I've made this horribly ugly place on my slide um, because you have to use the version of Vagrant from vagrantup.com. You cannot use the version that comes with your operating system. You cannot use the one from uh, basically any other vendor system. And that has to do with the way PDK and Vagrant have individual Ruby paths. So you install Vagrant to manage your VirtualBox systems. Uh, this example is using VirtualBox because again, it's the easiest way to get virtual machines running. Um, you can also use Docker, you can use LibVirt, you can use GCE, you can use a lot of different systems, but this is the easiest version that works across Windows, Linux, and Mac. So the first thing we're gonna do is update our RubyGems. Um, hopefully you're familiar with the uh, Ruby gem ecosystem, um, but if not, gems are kind of reusable code components that plug into uh, Ruby. So gem files are the way that the tool bundler, which is the command down here, um, knows what to install. In this case, we're installing Simp Beaker Helpers, and we're suggesting this because Simp Beaker Helpers was kind of built to add the missing pieces um, that were kind of, well, missing from Beaker. Um, and there's not, again, there's nothing sim specific about it. It's not going to do weird things to your system. It's literally just a bunch of helpers that help you develop uh, your code for uh, your test for Beaker. Um, so you run PDK bundle update. In this case, you wanna make sure to use the PDK command because that uses the PDK Ruby subsystem. PDK bundle update, it says it's using uh, Ruby 2.5.3, Puppet 6.8.1, and then spews out a ton of information about um, the gems that get installed. So now that we've got our gem dependencies in place, we want to update our fixtures. Fixtures are used by both our spec puppet and Beaker to um, <clears throat> download the puppet module dependencies for your project. So some people have asked, why can't I use a puppet file? And the fixtures pull down dependencies for your tests which may include things that are not actually dependencies for your module itself. You may wanna have more complex tests than, um, than a base puppet file would, would cover and um, that is covered in your metadata.json. So in here, I'm outputting what, we have, what I have in the fixtures.yaml for the demo module. I'm pulling down both the <coughs> simplib module, which is simps kind of a standard lib, uh, again, items that we've extended over time, they're helpful functions uh, and whatnot. 
And then Puppet's uh, standard lit as well to give us those wonderful functions we all love to use. Um, so there's a command here called spec prep. And what that command does is downloads those fixtures into the current uh, module uh, test environment. There's a directory called, <coughs> um, you can see, if you can sort of see here, there's a directory called spec under the project. So it's multi-node being the module, then spec, fixtures, and modules. Fixtures is kind of a Ruby convention for things you're going to use during your tests but aren't part of your actual code base. So we run this command and it downloads simplib and it downloads puppet lab standard lib from the forge. You can also replace this with your own Git server or your internal forge or anything like that. All right, so now that we've gotten our project set up, we've gotten Beaker, uh, gotten our gem dependencies installed, and we've gotten our Puppet module dependencies installed, we need to update our uh, main acceptance helper. Um, the, the, the way PDK lays down its components, it allows for pretty easy extensions. Uh, in this case, it didn't. Um, the spec helper is kind of self-contained. So what we did was we um, extended the spec helper acceptance to uh, require a local version of that file, just like it does for the gem file and other dependencies in PDK. There's lots of documentation on PDK online, and it covers the, the, the dependency chains and extensions that way. Um, and we did this because we expect PDK to overwrite this file at some point with something that looks suspiciously like this. Right, guys? <laughs> um, all right, so this basically sets us up to start running tests and making sure the Ruby code is uh, ready to go. Um, <clears throat> so now we're actually, I'm actually dumping the spec helper <coughs> acceptance local, which is our local version in the module of the um, acceptance helpers. Acceptance helpers being a convention just to put it in a beaker space, or a acceptance test space that is separate from your uh, R spec puppet testing space, you know, unit, unit test space. So we're going to require sent beaker helpers, which is the gem that we added as a dependency in the beginning. And we're going to add a line that says include simp colon colon beaker helpers. What that does is it drags in all of the code that we've written um, in the simp beaker helpers to kind of give us the, the value add for making beaker easy. Um, <clears throat> we're now going to go through every host that we have defined, and we're going to install Puppet on it. Unless, we added an unless here, uh, you have an environment variable that says beaker provision equals no. So if on the command line you said beaker provision equals no, and you ran the testing command, then it wouldn't install Puppet. That lets you get a completely clean environment if you so choose. We then had this very mysterious function called fix a rat on. And this is one that we ended up putting in some beaker helpers to take care of setting up default YAM repos, take care of uh, fixing nit noids um, in terms of setting up your time properly and, and uh, potentially fixing SELNX context, things like that. And this is one that, again, is carefully crafted to not affect systems that are you know, uh, not Red Hat. Um, and we do have tests in Beaker that cover Red Hat, Oracle Linux, and Windows. Um, and then we have this uh, line down here that says to copy all of our fixture modules to all the hosts. So, we did, so previously, we had a fixtures.yaml. We ran spec prep to download all those fixtures. And now, we're running this to make sure those fixtures get put into the Puppet environment on the remote hosts. And, this, and passing it the hosts array copies it to every host that you're going to be testing on. And so this basically sets you up to run Puppet Apply on every host without any problem. Make sense? Excellent. Two people nodded. I like it. All right. So setting up the tests. So now we've done all the, the, te the, the prep for setting up tests. You, you shouldn't have to twiddle with that ever again. Um, shouldn't. Um, so setting up the Beaker node sets. This, to me, is actually one of the best features about Beaker. Um, Beaker basically gives us a YAML file that we can go into and just define our, our node sets completely. Um, host is a magic tag that says these are our hosts. Um, and here, well, let me, let me back up a bit. So inside of the acceptance directory, you create a node sets directory. You then create a default.yaml. Default.yaml is the file that it will be used as your default node set if no other node set is defined and selected. So we define our hosts. In this case, um, we're giving it the short host name of EL7. It's a uh, CentOS 7 system. Um, 
roles are arbitrary tags that you can use to perform logic selection on your, on your nodes during your tests. Um, they are completely arbitrary. Use them as you will. Um, the platform is EL7 x86-64. That is absolute sorcery. Um, if you're using an EL7 system, um, make it that. If it's EL6, replace the 7 with the 6. You kind of get the idea. Um, eventually, that'll be documented, I'm sure. Um, the hypervisor is vagrant. And the box, so the box is literally the, the, the box you would get from HashiCorp's uh, site. The box is CentOS slash 7, which will give us the very latest version of the CentOS 7 system. So down below that, we have our config. So config is a global configuration that applies to all hosts that are defined. Our log level is verbose because we want to see tons of garbage flying through our screen. Usually we recommend running in verbose mode because um, you can debug better. So basically if something fails, you can debug it, see what's going on. Once your test works, you might want to take that back down to the default of notice so that you don't get just ever growing amounts of garbage. We, we actually leave ours in verbose mode in our CI systems because if something breaks, we can then go back, scroll up the thousands of lines of logs and figure out what actually happened. Um, the type is AIO. That is absolute magic. Um, that's kind of the legacy of things converting from Puppet 3 to Puppet 4 and going on to Puppet 5. And once Puppet 5 came around, this wonderful thing called Puppet Environment came out. So this is the version of the modern Puppet that you want to use. Basically, make, make this is always AIO. Leave it alone. This is, um, <laughs> just do it. Um, and this will be Puppet 5 or Puppet 6 based on which version of Puppet you actually want to install. And then down here, we're setting the default vagrant memory size and CPUs defined for our nodes. In this case, 256 megs of RAM and one CPU. That will apply to all nodes unless otherwise defined. So you can override any of this up here in the node definition. So you can have one node that has six gigs of RAM and everything else can be 256 megs. All right, a very simple test. So this is literally a functional test it is kind of the smallest test I could come up with that, made, that would make sense. Um, so down here, spec acceptance. Uh, the convention is that tests in our spec all end with underscore spec. So spec acceptance, zero, zero, underscore test, underscore spec to RB. We put the zero, zero on there because we found over time that doing things alphabetically was horrible. Um, so we dropped them in there with numbers, makes your life a lot easier. So we require spec helper acceptance, which of course you'll remember is that file we set up with all the default magic. The test name is single node test. That's just a useful name for you. It just gets it's output into the uh, test output and is useful for debugging and kind of knowing what's going on. Um, describe gathering puppet facts. That's what we're actually going to do during this test. And so hosts.each, we're looping through every host in our node set, in this case one, one host, but we're looping through them all. And saying on host, context is a, uh, it, it's basically a grouping, um, it's a namespacing function in RSpec that allows you to kind of keep your variables and your tests contained and inside of a, a useful human readable namespace. And in our lovely broken English here, it do, but uh, it do. Um, and the important part is we'll sit, we're saying, so we defined host, and so on every host, we're gonna run factor p grab the output, strip the output, and pull out all the lines. So that puts it into an array of lines that factor return to you. We put that into a result variable, and now, using standard RSpec syntax, we say expect result search for error, search for factor, to be empty. So factor should have thrown no errors. It's kind of the, the crux of that test. Now, as a note, on the bottom right-hand side, do not ever, ever, ever use server spec. Server spec is included with Beaker. It can be useful, but server spec is not multi-host safe. It only runs on one host. It's really hard to make work across different hosts. And, um, and basically, we have a thing that kind of does what server spec does. It's called Puppet. You might be familiar with it. Um, the Puppet resource command in J with JSON output is actually a wonderful thing to run through here. And we kind of just replaced server spec with that because it was you know, part of the ecosystem. <clears throat> So, how do we run this thing? Again, PDK, because we want the PDK Ruby space. So PDK, bundle, exec, rake, beaker. It then prints out a lot of garbage. That you're running the single node tests, if you remember from the description, describe block. It uh, checks the prep modules, it goes through and says, okay, everything's good, and now gathering puppet facts, which again, if you remember right here, describe, 
Gathering puppet facts, got it. So single node test, gathering puppet facts. Good, single node test, gathering puppet facts. We're looping through the hosts. So on the first host, EL7, should be empty was the test. So we were checking for errors, we were checking to make sure that the array containing errors was empty, and it was. After that, Beaker kindly goes and destroys everything, and it gives us a nice summary that says it ran one example, had no failures, and it took 14.4 seconds. So that's it, an entire Beaker test. That's, that's how hard it is to actually use and run Beaker. Um, once you get it running, it's, it's completely consistent across all of your modules, and you don't even have to use it with modules, you can use it to test anything. We actually use it to test uh, building ISOs for the simp build. So all the way up from scratch. All right, now that that's a ton of you know, walls of text, quick break for quick questions, and uh, if anybody has anything. All right, so moving on from the puppies. Um, a multi-node test, which is actually what we're here for. So, going through quickly, updating the default YAML. We've now added a second host, which is EL6. I want to check and see if EL7 and EL6 can do the same thing correctly. Great. So, really, the updates are platform EL6 instead of EL7, and box is CentOS 6. Easy enough. <laughs> so, we run it. And now, the same thing. Multi-node test, gathering facts on EL7 should be empty. Got it. On EL6, should be empty. Got it. Success. We now know that our code works on both EL7 and EL6. Well, running factor works on EL7 and EL6. So now let's do something interesting, um, which is actually a server client test. Like let's do something that we're, we wanna actually check happens between the server and client successfully. So in here, we're gonna define a role called server and a role called client. That lets us differentiate between the two easily. We made a pup puppet module, so let's actually do some puppet. It would be nice, right? So here we have our multi-node class. We say is server and is client. If you're a server, include multi-node server. If you're a client, include multi-node client. And make sure both sides have the netcat package installed, netcat being the tool we're going to use to actually see if traffic can communicate between the two. The server has a port, has a output file we're going to write to. We turn off firewall DNIP tables because I don't feel like dealing with it for this demo. Um, <laughs> and then we create a file called uh, netcat listen, um, which is executable, which basically listens on the netcat port and has, <coughs> Uh, and, and writes to the output file. And that code's not right, and I gotta fix that. <laughs> um, so in the client, basically it writes another file called netcat send, and echoes a message over to the server. So basically, server set up a listener, client set up a sender, now let's see if it works. All right. So, <clears throat> we have to set up, so this gets more complicated, because what we're doing is we're actually doing a full puppet code stack, including Hira. So, um, we're using the basically variable declaration syntax in our spec, which allows us to predefined late, uh, late, realize, late binding variables. Um, so our test port is one, two, three, four, five. We have an output file. This is the message we expect to be written, which is a special test message. Um, and then we want the server FQDN. Well, I built these nodes. I don't know what they are. I'm not gonna hard code this. So Beaker has a function called fact on, which gets a fact from a host. So fact on the only host with role from hosts server, get the which is an FQDN. So get the fully qualified domain name from our server. Down here we have server hire data, which is just a just a hash. Is server is true? Port is test port. Output file is test output file as defined up here. Client hire data is client is true. Server is the server FQDN as defined here as basically discovered from the server. Uh, the client port is test port, and the test message is the a special test message. All right, so the basic test. It should run Puppet. That's kind of the first test we always run. Basically, it should just, the, the manifest should apply and not be broken. So apply manifest on, host, manifest, catch failure is equal true. If you, if you, sorry. If you remember, our entire manifest here is include multi-node. That's it, that's all it does. So it puts in the higher data, includes multi-node, and then runs it. And it should be impotent. We always have this check as well, because if this isn't true, something bad is going to happen in production. So apply it again, and instead of catching failures this time, catch all changes. All right, so now we configure the server. So we set the higher data on the server. So on every host with role server, all of them, set the higher data on the server to the server higher data run Puppet to make sure that the um, code actually applies with higher data correctly in place, and that it is also out impotent. 
client side, do the same thing. Set the hire data on host, client hire data, which again was defined earlier. Run puppet, catch failures, should be idempotent, catch changes. If all this passes, you have a pretty darn good chance that your module is functional on a real host. And in this case, on two real hosts. All right, another eye break. This is our new simp mascot, it's a penguin. It's great, we love it. Come by the booth later. Um, all right, so now to actually do the test. We have to send, we're gonna send a message, right? We wrote a, we wrote a listener, we wrote a sender. They, they both function well. So on the host, run the file that we wrote through our Puppet manifest. So actually run that cat listen and then sleep for two seconds to make sure everything finalizes. And that script was created with multi -node, the multi-node server class. On the client, and again, this happens and then stops. So that happened on the server. You're now jumping down to the client and running on the client. So now on the client, you should send a message to the server. So go to the client and run the netcat send program, and it sends from all the clients to all the servers, if you had defined more than one. <clears throat> now we go back to the server. So run the server, run the client, and then go check the server to make sure you actually got the message. So you go back to the message, go back to the server, we grab the contents of the test output file, File contents on is again a beaker helper, or it's a built-in beaker function to get contents of any file in the system. Plop that into our content variable, and then expect the stripped version, so no, no white space on the ends version of the content to equal our test message. And that's it. And yes, it works. <laughs> Take my word for it, it's fine. Um, so running the test, you see, again, walking through all the steps, it, on the EL7 server, it sets up the higher data, runs Puppet, is idempotent. On the EL6 client, sets up the higher data, runs Puppet, is idempotent. Going back to the EL7 server, starts the listener. Going back to the EL6 client, sends the message to the server. Going back to the EL7 server, a seven server validates that it actually received the test message. And now we're gonna have more code. But we're not. All right, so now we know that our code functions on a single node to get with the first test. It functions as a server. It functions as a client. It actually processes information across a network. So if you had actually set up firewall rules or TCP wrappers or anything else that might have gotten in the way of that communication, you know that it actually works. And you also know that there are no functional configuration issues. Um, this is really important with a lot of projects because we found that the documentation might not always be correct. Um, and when you set it up completely to spec and the service starts, it still doesn't work. So you don't really know that your code is working until you verify that your code is working between two nodes, at least two nodes. Moving on to a bit of debugging. Um, there's a nice environment variable called simp beaker destroy, sorry, called beaker destroy. You can set it to beaker destroy equals no to not destroy the VMs at all, no matter what. You can also set it to beaker destroy equals on pass, which will only destroy the nodes if your, um, if your tests do not pass. <clears throat> sorry, only destroy the nodes if your tests do pass. Um, once that happens, you can navigate down into .vagrant slash beaker vagrant files slash node set name, in this case default, default.yaml, and run completely stock vagrant commands. So in this case, we hop down there, we run vagrant status, and we see that our EL7 and EL6 nodes are both running and are, and are based on VirtualBox. We can then vagrant SSH to EL7, and unless you're testing PAM or SSH, that'll probably work. Um, if that doesn't work, you can still bring up the VirtualBox GUI and get to them that way via the console. And here we have a shell, drops us in, no problem, in our EL7 server, so we can debug, we can test, we can, we can poke around and figure out what's going on. Um, you can run, uh, so the way Beaker works is it actually uh, uploads each of those manifest snippets as a separate file, and you can run puppet apply on any of those produced uh, files. The one downside is that they aren't ordered by time, so you just kind of have to dig through what got ship, shipped over there and figure out uh, which one you need to run. In this case, it, we have three manifests that got shipped over to our nodes, and it turns out we want to apply this horrible B6G, whatever it is. Um, but we can run, as the Vagrant user, we can run sudo opt puppet labs bin puppet apply, path to file, and it'll, it will apply the same puppet code to, your, to that existing node once again. And that means, again, we can go in and debug live on the system, figure out what was wrong, pull it back out, patch our code, and then run the test again. 
makes it very easy to do. All right, so making things easier. As I mentioned, we created the Scent Beaker Helper's Ruby Gem uh, to kind of give the missing pieces, as we felt, to the Beaker ecosystem. Uh, we added something called Suites, and Suites run completely independent tests in the same module space. And what that means is you can have a functional test for one type of um, scenario, and then you can have a functional test for a different type of scenario that have all different node sets and different virtual machines using the same public code base. Um, we use this for compliance tests because we want to test our functionality, but once we test our functionality, we have dirty boxes. And then we have a compliance suite which sets it up in a compliant mode, validates it using um, either the inspect or SCAP scanners, and provides the output during the compliance test. Um, a few uh, helper methods that we added is the ability to put YAM repositories in your node sets. Um, and a copy to method, which uses the fastest method for copying nodes, uh, for copying your fixtures into your nodes. Uh, previously, it uses S it used SCP for everything. It was horribly slow for large collections of modules. So if you're using Docker, we use Docker copy. If you're using a Linux system, we use rsync, and we fall back to SCP if we have to. <coughs> and we added a write higher data to uh, function, which allows you to write arbitrary hashes of higher data into your system without having to create temp files and move things around. Um, we added the ability to flip your system into FIPS 148-2 mode at the kernel level for evaluation um, for rail compatible systems. Um, and we also added an experimental virtual machine snapshot and restore support um, for debugging your tests over time. If you have a very long running test, we have some that take upwards of an hour. Um, you can actually go through and snapshot and then you have to and then modify your code to basically skip all the things that you want to skip, restart from the snapshot point and go forward. And we have lots of examples. A few good reference examples are our aid module. It's a very simple module. It sets up aid, runs it, um, and it contains a compliance suite. So you can see the difference between the suites. The rsyslog module is actually why we started getting into multi-node testing to begin with. It turns out that rsyslog might not work as documented in all cases. Um, so we had to have four systems, four different suites, and we had to have actual firewall rules and failover and IP tables blocking and everything else to actually determine if our rules worked. And by doing this, we actually could make a module that handles the weird edge cases of some of the rsyslog <coughs> systems. We have the SIMP module, which is essentially a profile that has eight different suites, including a Windows suite, as an example. It does a full puppet server and client setup, and it covers firewalls, SE Linux, FIPS mode, the whole, the whole gamut. And then SIMP core is more of a control repo style uh, module that spins up all of SIMP using multiple, multiple methods, including RPM installation, R10K, et cetera. So this is literally a full system stack with multiple clients, LDAP, DNS, the whole deal. Um, you can check out the gitlabci.yaml files in all of our projects to see how we run the tests and get a good example of uh, GitLab CI pipelines. And that hopefully gives me enough time to take some questions. And uh, this is my joke of the day, which is a man page. Hmm. Um, and all the code can be found on my GitHub uh, at the Puppetize 2019 Multi-Node Beaker project. Um, and I'm open to any questions, how-tos, concerns, and also available downstairs. Yes? We, we had a puppet consultant come to look at our stuff we were talking about, uh, not multi-node testing, but acceptance testing. Mm -hmm. Did he seem to think that this was better than Beaker? I don't remember. Um, it's documented. That helps a lot. Um, <laughs> um, it really comes down to whether or not you need multi-node testing, right? So Litmus is new. Litmus is supported. Litmus is, in general, easier to get started with at this point. Litmus is only, um, isn't it only uh, with uh, containers? Uh, no, it can handle virtual machines as well. And, um, and again, it's, it's, it's being built up. It's improving all the time. Um, and again, we're, we're kind of in that crux where it doesn't quite do multi-node. Um, so we, need, we still need multi-node, so we're still using Beaker. Um, and it's kind of up to Puppet as to which direction things are going to go. Yes? Um, your examples were primarily Red Hat, and yeah. sounds like that. But of course, it sounds like you can use Ubuntu. Absolutely, yeah. You just basically have to change the machine. Yep, that's it. Okay. 
yeah, we tested we tested some things on Ubuntu and SUSE and OpenSUSE and everything we grabbed. Oh well, that was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Beaker can connect. So in that case, there I had I found no way to emulate an AIX system well. Um, if you have one, let me know, please. Um, but Beaker does have the ability to do direct connections. So you can literally set it up to just SSH out to a real AIX box and, and run the test. Yeah. I don't have an AI Xbox because I don't have that much money or space. So. Yes. What about using like uh, your your actual high res data? Absolutely. Um, so in the example we showed, uh, that was a hash to to put in kind of sample higher data. Um, the node, the, the module higher data is pulled in automatically. But if you wanted to actually put in your real higher data, you can absolutely take a file and just drop it in. Not a problem. Yes. Uh, in your example code, which of those helpers came from systems and helpers which are built in Ah, so the helpers are actually written by you. Um, so the, the original helpers came from PDK, and then it was extended to basically drag in the, the, the uh, Simp Beaker helpers libraries, and that was it. So those, those don't come by default anywhere. They're kind of a per module thing, and some modules just need different capabilities, so you kind of have to keep them that way in general. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, in our case, uh, the compliance tests are driven by the SIMP compliance engine, which is a uh, module you can get on the Forge that allows you to define uh, sets of compliance data maps to policies that. Um, Basically, it allows you to both verify and switch into different compliant modes. So uh, STIGs, NIST um, are the public ones. And then private, uh, we have CIS support, um, HIPAA, PCI DSS, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that, that's literally why we have a separate suite. So we take that pre-built data, it gets applied on a module by module basis, and then the compliant suite puts it in that mode and scans it with the appropriate scanner. All right. Okay, well thank you for coming and uh, hope you enjoyed it.